This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. Uh, we're continuing today with our um, series on the kingdom of God. And when Jesus wanted to make uh, a point, he would often repeat it several times uh, to his disciples so it, it sank in. And we are disciples, so I'm going to repeat something so it sinks in. With that in mind, I just want to uh, give us a reminder of, of what the kingdom of God is. As we've already heard in the series, uh, the word kingdom can be de uh, described as the king's domain. The place where the king rules and reigns. So the kingdom of God is the place where God rules and reigns, the kingdom of God. Scripture, sh uh, scripture shows us a place where God's rule and reign is perfectly and wonderfully displayed. And that place is called heaven. And heaven is the perfect example of God's rule and reign in all its fullness. But God's plan and purpose was always and has always been that his rule and reign would also be evident on earth as it is in heaven. And in Matthew 6, verse 10, Jesus gave his disciples the blueprint. I know we like that word here, a blueprint. And the instruction to pray to the Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as his followers, our prayer continues to be, doesn't it? Your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. But how do we determine what the will of God is? Well, we discover what the will of God is by studying his word and by asking his Holy Spirit for continued insight and understanding. So it's word and spirit combined that has allows us to discover what the will of God is. And when we do that, we discover that God's kingdom reflects both his heart and his character. And we see that God's heart and character is perfectly displayed in his son, the life of his son, Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And when we read the gospel accounts, it becomes evident that those closest to him, closest to Jesus, his, his inner circle of followers often struggled with the concept of the kingdom of God simply because it wasn't something that they'd ever seen before. It wasn't something that they'd ever experienced before. The disciples' idea of what kingdom should look like was based on and what they had experienced and seen before they met Jesus, which was a kingdom whose king was a Roman emperor and was powered by Roman rule and governance, a kingdom based on military might and fueled by oppression and fear. But the kingdom that Jesus demonstrated was completely different. It was a way of life that he modeled to them by Jesus himself, who introduced and inaugurated this new kingdom. Jesus was the king of the kingdom who walked with them, who talked with them, 
who ate meals with them and demonstrated what the love of God looked like wherever he went. Jesus shows his disciples that the kingdom of God is a way of life. It's a way of living that reflects the heart and character of God. So I want to suggest to you today that rather than thinking of the kingdom of God as a place, we should maybe think of it as a choice. Kingdom living is a choice that we make and it's a decision that we take. A choice and a decision to live our lives submitted to the rule and reign of King Jesus. So in that case, the kingdom of God can be found in a place. And that place is in the hearts of those who acknowledge Jesus as Lord. So let's take a look today at uh, today's verse that shows us another aspect of what the kingdom of God looks like. I think Paul's got that for us. This comes from Romans 14 verse 17. In fact, what I've done, what I asked Paul to do was to include some of verse 16 uh, to give the statement some context, which is always useful. Romans 14 verse 16, starting there then. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. As the scripture reference indicates, this verse is found in the Apostle Paul's letter written to the believers in Rome. A multi-ethnic community of believers that consisted of different nationalities, including both Jews and Gentiles. Just to bring some context, when Paul says in verse 16, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. The good thing that he's referring to there is the liberty and freedom that a life in Christ brings. It was a liberty that other believers in Rome may have struggled to accept as being acceptable behavior to some of the brothers in Rome. So what do I mean by that? Well, just like we heard in our series when we covered Galatians, uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, there were still some secondary issues causing friction and unrest between believers in the church in Rome as well as it was in the church in, Gal in Galatia. And these issues had their roots in the Jewish Old Testament laws. They were centered around the topics of eating and drinking, which is why Paul refers to the fact that the kingdom is not about eating and drinking. There were a number of believers in the church who felt that certain foods should not be eaten because they were restricted in Old Testament Mosaic law. And these believers had strong convictions about certain religious pra practices that were instigated in the Old Testament under the law of Moses and felt that it was right, the right thing to do to carry over those restrictions into their new covenant lives that were meant to be centered around the faith and trust in Jesus as Messiah and Lord. Hence the reason for Paul's statement telling them that the kingdom of God was not a matter of eating or drinking. Potentially, it could be very easy for us to look back with an air of spiritual superiority and say, how could these believers in Rome get sidetracked on their spiritual journey and stumble over such things as food and drink, and maybe not directly linked to Old Testament dietary restrictions, but it's possible, it's possible that we could have similar experiences and issues with our fellow believers in our own church 
community settings as we meet to celebrate Jesus around our king's tables. There may be people at our tables that we're eating and drinking with who have strong views around the topic of animal welfare, cruelty in farming, farming practices and excessive carbon emissions generated through meat and dairy farming. We can, we can all watch Country File and see the, the issues that we're talking about that have prompted these people at our tables to adopt a, a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Now, Paul's advice and guidance at the start of chapter 14 is this, reading from verse 3. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Paul's godly advice, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit as he wrote the, that letter, focuses on the importance of unity. On issues that are central and essential to the spiritual health of the church. But he also emphasizes, doesn't he, the need to be mindful and considerate of those who have issues of conscience, issues of conscience over specific personal convictions. And I read a great, a great quote from a life application study Bible that I was glancing through, the commentary. And it says our principle should be this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in everything, love. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in everything, love. And today's verses shift the emphasis from what the kingdom is not about, eating and drinking, onto what the kingdom of God is about, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You could describe the difference between these groupings like this. Eating and drinking are physical issues. What you eat and drink does not move you closer to God or further away from God. Food and drink relate to the stomach. And without getting into a graphic biology lesson, whatever we eat or drink is expelled after a period of time. In contrast, righteousness, peace, and joy are spiritual issues. They are matters of the heart, our innermost being. And in a spiritual sense, what is in your heart matters more than what is in your stomach. King Solomon, who's described as one of the wisest men to put pen to paper, wrote in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, God has set eternity in the human heart. In other words, because we are created in God's image, we are not like any other creature that God created. And he made us with a unique knowledge that there is something more than the world we see around us. God made us with the intention of being connected to him and in relationship with him. Every human heart has a desire for that relationship, a desire for a relationship with the creator who made us. For that desire to be fulfilled and satisfied and although many search for alternative ways to satisfy that longing of the heart the bible tells us there is only one way to restore our relationship with god and that is through his son jesus proverbs 4 starting at verse 20 gives us more godly wisdom when it says my son 
pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them be out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. By setting eternity in our hearts, God is directing us towards the answer and solution for all our searching. And the answer is himself. Jesus tells his disciples in John 14 verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the root to God. And in today's verse, Paul is highlighting what could be described as elements or virtues that are the very essence of the character and nature of Jesus. Righteousness, peace, and joy. The source of these elements for kingdom living is Jesus, the King of the kingdom. And if we take them in the order that they're written in, Righteousness. How would we describe righteousness? Righteousness means being right and doing the right thing. And it's not something we can earn or generate ourselves. It can only come through faith in Jesus Christ. Earlier in his letter to the Romans, Paul in chapter 3 verse 20 says, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And verse 21 goes on. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ. Our attempts at righteousness don't impress God. But God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus, the righteous one, as full payment for the death sentence that our sin deserved. The righteous for the unrighteous. It was his sacrifice that allowed us to access the king's kingdom, the kingdom of God. The righteousness of Christ has been credited into our account. But once we are declared righteous by God, we need to continue to Pursue righteousness. We could refer to this as practical righteousness. And this is an ongoing pursuit for the rest of our Christian life. This righteousness is an obedience to the will of God that comes from the heart. It can be described as holy living or obedient living. I've heard it described as well as ethical righteousness. It is right behavior in the Christian life. Right behavior in the Christian life. It is Christ-likeness. Christ made us right before God when we had no righteousness of our own. But now we need to live right in a way that honors God. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says that believers are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. It's a process that's going on in the lives of believers. This is a lifelong progressive growth in Christ-likeness. This is the kingdom of God. This is the type of righteousness that Paul's talking about. It's what God is doing in your heart that is shaping your character and acts as a, a moral compass for your life. This is the righteousness of Jesus in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, time is flying by. Uh, we'll move on to peace. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Peace is an essential element in kingdom living. And who is the source of our peace? Jesus. When the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, announced the future arrival of the long-awaited Messiah, this is what he says in chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. In John 14, when Jesus is comforting his disciples, this is what he says in verse 26. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. Isn't that strange? Why does he think peace is so important? Reason? Because it is. My peace I give you, he says. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be trouble, troubled and do not be afraid. You see, worldly peace is usually defined as the absence of, of conflict. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, gives us kingdom peace. A peace that is not of this world. And at times, in, in unimaginable circumstances, which can defy logic to the onlooker, who doesn't understand this peace, it, it can be a deep-seated confidence and assurance to the believer in the one who knows you by name. The one who holds you and sustains you. A peace that comes from knowing God and being known by God. Paul in Philippians 4 verse 6 writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So as we commit our concerns to the Lord in prayer and trust Him to take care of these situations that we face, then His peace comes flooding into our heart. That's the kingdom of God. That's the type of peace that Paul is talking about here. What God is doing in your heart. In closing, I want to move on to the third thing. Joy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. In chapter 16 of the, uh, the book of John, Jesus tries to prepare his disciples for the events leading up to his crucifixion, his death and his subsequent resurrection. But obviously they would have had difficulty seeing beyond his crucifixion and death. And reading his words from verse 20 of John 16, this is what Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will be able to take away your joy. The disciples would see Jesus again after his resurrection and experience 
the joy of a reunion with him. Jesus' presence brought joy to them. And King David understood this so clearly, that God's presence was the source of his joy. Reading from one of David's Psalms, Psalm 16, verse 8. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. He continues in verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That's the joy that the kingdom of God is talking about. Kingdom joy comes from a Christ-centered confidence that is rooted in knowing that we have God's presence with us at all times through the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. And even Jesus was able to look beyond his, his own harrowing experience of crucifixion to see the joy waiting for him on the other side by making a way for a lost mankind to return to the Father. That's what sustained him. The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 2, to look to Jesus, to fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated now at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus saw beyond the, beyond the anguish with a joy that would carry him through, knowing that he was carrying out the Father's will to restore mankind to, him, to the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Righteousness, peace, and joy are all hallmarks of the life of Jesus. And as a consequence, as we continue to be transformed into his likeness, they should be hallmarks in our lives as well. But we need to know the source of righteousness, peace, and joy. And it's our Lord Jesus Christ. To do that, we must fix our eyes on Jesus. We must look to his word and the power of his Holy Spirit to guide us. Now, I, I want to finish with a prayer, but I want to give an opportunity as well for people to respond to what they've heard today. Even if it's a raised hand or, or just an acknowledgement of just receiving something from God. But let's, let's just pray together first. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.